Well, thank you. Um, I always love this, uh, having an opportunity to come talk to you, especially all of you that are new trustees, uh, to really focus in on the budget and to be able to follow um, the uh, ladies that just spoke on the revenue. So we build the story for you so um, there won't be as much redundancy. So I'm going to start with um, key budget concepts. The, the information I'm bringing you is really from the lens of you as a trustee. So the basics, uh, some of you um, may be so new, you're, we need to remind you of some of the basics. I apologize if some of this is um, not as in detail initially. But we start with uh, the board. Has part of your major authority is approving the annual budget. And it has to be available on the college um, website within a certain number of clicks uh, and the state. Uh, we provide it to the state. The key is the money follows mission. So the big piece that, that you are helping in this process of the budget development is ensuring that the money is going to the priorities of the institution. It isn't just who spends the most, gets the most the next year, developing ways that the budget and the methodology of how the funding is allocated uh, to the institution is following the mission of the institution. There's a lot of uh, local policy decisions uh, that become part of the policy that the trustees have the authority to set for the institution. So that can include um, what type of budget model you have. We talk about a modified zero-based budgeting. What that means is decisions on whether um, at the, any unspent funds at the end of the year, if they just roll back to your fund balance, or if they carry forward in some way. So in our institution, we sweep that up at the end of the year. So it's, it's an annual budget. We do have certain exceptions of multi-year funds, things uh, that have restrictions to them to where it can only be used for a certain purpose. If you have student activity fees, anything not spent, rolls to the next year uh, to continue to be used for the purposes designated. Construction funds. You may have grant funds. There's, there are accounts that are multi-year, but for the base discretionary uh, budget, there's a decision in your policy on whether uh, which ones of those uh, would carry forward or not. We've also chosen things like preventive maintenance on our facilities, that that's one of the accounts that is designated, can only be used for that purpose and any unspent funds in that year can continue to roll to the next year for the budget purposes um, in that case. Have to look to see what I'm revealing is behind me. Okay, on distribution method methodology. Now this is normally operationally within the budget team, not normally part of the policy, but it'll be part of what I'll be sharing with you. Depending on the institution and how you're organized, how, you're, how the management uh, occurs uh, plays a big part in how how you're going to distribute the funds because the money has to go to the departments based on how they manage they're responsible to then manage the money so you could have a very functional structure that we'll talk about in a minute uh, to where uh, it's a very there's less duplication or you could have an institution like I'll share on Alamo Colleges where we have individual accredited colleges. And so we go through a methodology, again, trying to incent the behavior we want through the budget. So that is part of our strategy in the distribution method. And I'm going to go ahead and click all the others up here because I can't see them. So then the other decisions in policy you'll see is what authority uh, that the board is giving that within certain line items in the budget that during the year, without coming to the board, money can be moved between accounts. So in our case, uh, it does allow uh, that, you, that we can move it between uh, different lines during the budget because we have estimates at the beginning of the year. And then as we manage the work, it allows us to redistribute that within certain uh, categories. In addition, you, there can be part of the methodology established in policy on whether there's a contingency account. We call ours the Chancellor's Institutional Reserve Account, which is a small discretionary account. It's set by a formula that's set by policy. And that is in every budget year so that since we only meet once a month as a board, 
it allows some discretion that's already pre-approved to where money cannot be spent out of that account, but it does allow with the chancellor's authority, if there was something that came up that was unanticipated, can move money from that account, that institutional reserve, to another budget account where it can be used without it having to go back to the board. And then finally, you may have some other guidelines that are part of the process, whether they're in policy or not. Ours is not in policy, but it's part of our methodology, which is whether we want to have a percent uh, personnel budget or an average class size target. Uh, that, again, for efficiency purposes, we may want to uh, set some guidelines that are part of our goals and part of our methods. And you may also uh, establish a pool for strategic initiatives. In our case, many years ago, we set aside as part of the budget process $2 million uh, for a student success fund. And it was designated for specific purposes, specific strategies that were discussed with the board and set when we set the budget. So that, again, we could keep moving the needle on certain things that we needed to put a little money to get uh, some strategies underway. So we talked a little bit about how the organizational structure uh, affects you. Um, in many years, I've uh, also presented with a peer of mine from Austin Community College. So I, I shared some of their uh, structure, because we used to contrast, and I thought I could still share that. In their structure, they're a one college model. They have one president, CEO. They have one set of administrators, um, one set of department chairs. It's, very, uh, it's, it's a very linear uh, structure. So for budget purposes, their budget can basically just build all those functional accounts, set all of those assumptions, and then set your budget. So it can be much uh, easier uh, as far as not easy in balancing the budget, but easy in the mechanics of how you look at the dollars in the budget. Uh, contrasting it with Alamo College's district, we're always trying to in to ensure that we are providing a budget methodology that's a fair, transparent allocation of the pool of money. So we, because we have five colleges individually accredited, we have 12 off-campus off sites supporting any county region, um, we have one chancellor, we have five vice chancellors that coordinate across those colleges and do a lot of district support operations on behalf of the colleges, such as our police department and all those things that are centralized and support all of the colleges under a collaboration agreement with the colleges. And we also have three vice presidents per college, so 15 vice presidents, that have similar functions, academic success at every college. So because of that structure, we ended up creating a high-level model that looks at how we allocate the pool of money based on where the work is occurring. What are the workload drivers? And so I'll spend some time showing you what that is. It may be applicable if you are an institution uh, that also has multiple locations, some some functions that are uh, done in multiple places, and you want to create a way that's not just who spends the most, they get the most money the next year, but that's tied to how many students they serve, if it's uh, facilities, it's tied to square footage changes, that it's basically a formula that creates a pool of money that then gets distributed. So it becomes a little more complex. I'm just going to share it today because it is an option that for some institutions can be helpful. But I would uh, say if your institution does not have that complexity, then it's, it may not be needed for you either. So other uh, starting points is as a, a board to think long range. What we do is we build the budget and together with our board is look at long term estimates of what we what we think is going to happen in state appropriations, all of our revenue streams and operational costs and what our capital needs are. We also um, focus in on when we're making revenue estimates, questions, we look at what's going on in the global, national, state economy. What might be the effect on state appropriations? Is tax revenues up or down? Um, we also look at, when we're talking about state appropriations, we're talking about their tax revenues. So we look at what's happening, what are we hearing on sales taxes, and, and what's happening at a state level that could affect the pool of money that then in the next biennium is going to affect our share of what decisions they make for us. And we have a lot of other competing priorities at the state for our funds, as you know. 
Um, what is our uh, taxing district uh, appraised value uh, looking like? Is it trending up? Is it trending down? To again, start planning ahead. So it's not just a single one-year budget. It's starting to think of, I may have downward pressure coming, so we need to be careful if we're doing labor ads because those are recurring costs and that could cause uh, some issues. So those are the things that as an institution um, in the budget process is considered. Uh, what's going on with financial aid? That could affect your enrollment. Uh, so again, it's pay what the institution is paying attention to is all of those predictors when we're setting those revenues. I put this slide in, I won't spend a lot of detail, but uh, folks have found it helpful. Is There's a couple key differences from our university partners we, um, as community colleges, have an ability uh, for debt and operations supported by property tax for the facilities versus the universities, uh, there's appropriations from the state to pay for their facilities. So that does drive this, what we've been seeing over the last um, 10 years or so, of pushing more and more burden locally, what used to be a public good, state funding that was very robust. Because we have tax, taxing authority, when money gets tight, it starts pushing to local, which is state, and also pushing local to perhaps us having to handle it through tuition. So it does make us different than our university partners. The other piece I highlight is that education in general, our, our core expenses, instruction, all of those things. Um, no one, uh, when we talk to parents, to let them understand that really no one out there in higher education is paying the full cost of education. It's highly subsidized, subsidized with financial aid. It's subsidized with the state appropriations that keeps our tuition low. So again, in context, we're always, we are the most affordable in tuition because we have available some of these other funds. And it's a very challenging time as we know, um, we've been pressured to educate more and more uh, students while state funding's been slashed over the years. Um, we, we talk about with our board, the kind of the three-legged stool, when you think of our revenue, that's what we have. And really, as recent as 10 years ago, uh, for Alamo College, it was pretty balanced across the state appropriations, the taxes, and the tuition. And then in just uh, for this academic year that we're in right now, you can see property tax for us at Alamo Colleges is now 46% of our revenues, and the state is down at 23. And we've been paying attention, as you have, on what's been happening with um, some of the bills that have come forward to look at capping our ability on our taxing authority, too. So it's, it's, a, it's been helpful for us. Each of you are in different areas with different situations. Uh, we've been fortunate to have a very di diversified economy in San Antonio. So uh, without changing our tax rate, we've actually benefited uh, with money that's helped us with some very, very old facilities that needed to be addressed, uh, as well as um, you know, bring some of these extra support services. We're still the, Texas is the lowest tuition in the nation when, among that. We've been watching that, so it's still a great deal for students. And then I want to shift real quick to then talk about kind of the budget concept in general a little bit more. I'm going to start trying to go a little bit faster, because I know we're limited on time, and you can probably read this quicker than me talking. So I'll try to go, and uh, definitely, um, you know, at the end, if there's something we need to go back to or you need to call me, uh, certainly do so. Uh, so the first model is that um, if you're an institution that is um, a kind of functional organization, not like ours with the five colleges and all the uh, 15 BPs, et cetera. Then this model, is it, it could start with um, budget development. all starts with strategic planning for all of us, that you've really got to know what's important, what is in your plan, and make sure your money is lining up to that. Uh, we look at uh, district strategies that we may be investing in for that plan. Uh, for us, we've done a lot of work in guided pathways over the years. Um, but we pay attention to the strategic plan. Uh, we then do um, detailed budgets that would be turned in in some fashion at your institution. It could be using technology. It could be just doing a spreadsheet submission, whatever, that collects 
what every department is requesting is for the budget the next year. Uh, that often is how it starts. And then the work of looking at that process of prioritizing uh, where we're gaining some efficiencies and where we're able to uh, maybe invest in some key strategies that uh, will help our student completion agenda and our um, other services. And then the board approves the strategic plan and the budget. You know, there's all of us start, it starts with revenue. You've got to estimate your revenue before you can even head to expense. And from that revenue estimate, you're really getting the volume of what you expect on enrollment. That then is key to understanding then what are you going to need for instruction and what are you going to need for student services. So everything ties together. So it all starts with revenue and then, um, and then goes through some sort of approval process uh, at the institution as they try to balance the revenues and expense to a proposal that then would ultimately come to the board for discussion of what is in those numbers. What are the strategies? What are uh, the key uh, opportunities we have? If there's perhaps some revenue, some additional revenue we weren't anticipating, what's our long-term outlook? All that discussion normally happens in those budget discussions with the board for approval. When we switch to Alamo Colleges, ours starts with determining our baseline revenues. We have a concept we call formula and non-formula. Formula are those things that we calculate based on certain um, projected um, items, such as taxes. We estimate what our property tax valuation rate uh, percent increase or decrease might be, uh, what the appeals are looking like on taxes, and then we calculate based on that what are we estimating our tax revenue is going to be. Uh, on the state, we're paying attention. If we're, at the early, if we're in the biennium, it, it's monitored during the, hot, the entire budget build process to see what the state's doing and what we might expect our state appropriations to be. Uh, tuition and fees running various scenarios based on growth projections or not, and then if you are having to consider a tu tuition change, um, then running those scenarios of the impact so that can be provided for the decision making of the board as you go forward. What we call non-formula are things that are not just general discretionary that comes out of this. It's basically things tied to restricted purposes. So for instance, we have about 28 special program uh, that are very high cost program, high equipment or, or maybe stipends for faculty to be able to attract um, for faculty. For those programs, we actually charge a special tuition rate on top of the regular um, that then that money is provided directly to which one of our colleges is offering the program. So it, it becomes a non-formula. It equals the revenue, whatever the revenue estimate is. We add the expense that allows them to have the instruction and the equipment needed to support that program. Um, on a revenue outlook, I know the last presentation talked about a lot of these things, but what we look at is on the state revenue, the key takeaway from this that we've been saying for years, flat is kind of the new growth. We get excited if we have a flat amount of pool of revenue from state appropriations. And the reason is because, as you know, on the contact hour funding, it, it isn't necessarily logical. We turn in all of this information that comes up with what the cost of our programs are across the entire state. All that gets turned in. And then from that, there's actually a formula where then way back in the day, we got funding of 80, 90 percent of those costs came through the state appropriations of that formula. At this point, we're down to 23 percent of what those costs are is actually what the dollar per contact hour rate we end up getting in the pool. And the reason is the state is solving for a pool of money that they have, and they're not necessarily looking at the, the number of students, contact hours, or anything that we have. So it becomes a pool the contact hours are still important to you as an institution that you grow because you're competing with the 50 peers on your share of that fixed pool. So that's really kind of what's happening on the contact hour side. So if all, if there was a, most of the other 50 colleges had growth and you didn't, then your share of that pool is impacted. Um, so that's what's shared in the prior uh, uh, presentation about the dollar per contact hour has really been declining. Um, and that's just because of the math of that. We also have the suit success points. This biennium, we had a uh, small rebound because the rate did 
that finally there was a wake up call that you can't keep cutting the rate if you want this to be an incentive uh, to where there was actually a rate increase. So that uh, hopefully will continue to at least stay the same rate per or go up. Uh, so that's where we see some opportunities in the funding from the state. Um, we have to watch the unfunded mandates. So those are all of the things that come through some bill that's not over in the funding bill that requires us to waive tuition for certain um, programs, whether uh, foster kids, firefighters, whatever. Any of those programs that come through that then is telling you, you don't have a choice, you have to waive the tuition for that, that becomes an unfunded mandate. For us, it's over $5 million a year of all of those kind of things. On top of that, we've elected as an institution on dual credit um, long before I got there, which is about 11 years ago, we've been waiving dual credit um, tuition. And so, uh, but that is a board decision and it is allowed in the you know, state law that that's one of the areas you can waive. Uh, so uh, every institution treats that differently and we'll talk, I know there's been a lot of discussion already. I do have a slide later that talks a little bit for us of how we look at our dual credit. So we'll talk a little more about that. On um, property tax, when we look at our opportunities and risk, it's tax by asset, whether, you, whether you're um, the property uh, outlook, the property valuation outlook for your community, if it's trending up or down, it could be an opportunity or a risk. Uh, for us, it's actually been uh, trending up. Um, it is the funding, and what we have to remind when we talk to the legislature, we have to remind them, it is there to fund these facilities. And across the nation, uh, universities and colleges have old facilities that need need money, you know, to keep them um, the type of place we need to have students. And there's not enough money in the world. It's competing with our annual operations. So you have to be very strategic to think about there's some subset of your budget that needs to be out there to continue to deal with that over the years, keeping your facilities where they need to be. Uh, because I know it's something we focused on. We started probably 11 years ago without actually having a set amount of our budget designated for preventive maintenance, and we're trying to get it to closer to about 3% of the replacement cost for property, which is a long challenge. We're not there yet, but uh, we've been steadily setting aside to make sure that we can deal with the roofing. Uh, the envelope of the building, all of those things. So that's key. Property tax, that's the only thing that's going to pay for it. The state can't pay for that. They also can't pay for your facilities employees and their benefits or any of that. It's, it's not part of the state funding. That is what your taxes pay for through both the debt rate and your operations rate. Um, and we've actually, from taxes going up, it's actually been mitigating for the loss from the state we've seen. So... Um, so right now, we dodged a bullet, this biennium, as you know, on um, having us exempted from the rollback rate cut that's currently at 8%. Others um, were hit with it being lowered to like 25 3.5%. Um, so that's something that we'll still have to fight probably every biennium for a while. Uh, so it's just right now, it's okay, but it may still face us in the future. And so then as we move to the uh, enrollment and tuition and fees, for us, the, the one thing I wanted to comment on was the, um, just like we were talking about dual credit, we've taken other strategies in the tuition side. We, we know that we can impact um, student uh, persistence and completion based on how we structure things. Uh, research shows that if they, uh, you know, we're going to lose students over the summer. So if we can keep them over the summer, they're more likely to come back in the fall. We also know if they take more credit hours, not just one class at a time, but if they get closer to full time, at least nine hours or something, then they're more likely to complete because they can get their associate's degree maybe in three years, not 10 years at one class at a time. So because of that, we created a summer momentum program that based on students taking uh, on average, at least 18 credit hours across fall and spring, which would be nine and nine, or they could get a free class in the summer uh, if they took uh, 
higher than that, on average 12 per term or 24 uh, across both terms. They could get two classes, which meant in two years they'd have their associate's degree and they'd get the full Pell without it being prorated. So that strategy is something, again, you can use things in your tuition strategy. Um, is to a scholarship, we can't waive tuition for those classes in the summer. It becomes kind of a scholarship. Um, but that, that's that been helpful to us, that we've seen uh, what we expected of persistence going up and grades being a little bit better on those that went at a faster pace and sticking with us. So I just bring that up, that when you get to tuition and fees, you've got to forecast your enrollment. You've got to forecast the mix of out of district, in district, depending on your rate structure the proportion that's dual credit, all that work goes in to see you could have opportunities to a mixed change if you're reaching more international students and you charge more for international. If you're reaching uh, more online, that's out of district, that could be uh, a revenue opportunity. Um, but you're going to have to have the services and the expenses to support that because then you're going to have to be able to have online services. They can't just come to the front counter. So it does have cost and uh, revenues to consider. But there are lots of opportunities there. Also, the one risk that I put on the slide is that um, most of us have been steadily working on trying to make sure that for all of our associate's degrees, we get that closer to that 60 credit hour. And we've been, that students don't stay forever and take 100 hours with us and use up uh, a lot of their time. That is putting downward pressure. So sometimes if you hear from your institution, hey, my contact hour projection is pretty flat. There's probably elephants moving in that. You could have the average contact hour per student going favorably. It's going down is what we want. They get just what they need and they move on and complete. You could have that going on at the same time you're having growth and it just happens to look flat. So there can be a story in there and it's worth unbundling it to really know what's happening. This one I won't go into the details, but this is one I've shared with some parent groups where there was, when they saw that our tuition went up, they tended to think, just like if you're a, a profit, a, you know, corporation, that must mean you're inefficient or you're making tons of profits. Well, we're nonprofit. This is heavily subsidized. What's hidden in the why we have to do is that three-legged stool. If the state revenue is going down, if taxes is being impacted, the only lever we have to continue to operate the open access is to um, also, um, the only lever is tuition in that case. So it is an inefficiency. So on average, our students only pay 19 cents of each $1 when you factor in the financial aid and all of the other things. So it's a story to tell. I know I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna flip through some data that's here for you. It's in the deck. We, every year, uh, for us, we, we pull a snapshot of all 50 community colleges to understand what the tuition and fees are. The, the point for this is everyone takes a different strategy on fees. For us, we buried our fees in tuition. We didn't have a lot of fees outside of it because for veterans, a lot of veteran reimbursement doesn't pay for fees. Other institutions may have done something different. So here takes the, for a 12-hour load, what's tuition and what would be fees, and then looking at it an average on the total tuition and fees, where you could really neutralize that variance by institution. And there it shows the impact of our free classes that you can't really see in a snapshot of just the 12 hours. Uh, the next one is same information, total tax rate. Buried in that is debt versus your operating, and that can vary by institution based on how they issued debt. Um, and so again, it's a lot of variation, but it's a snapshot of what all the peer colleges have. And this is available every year. TAC provides this information. We just go through and provide it to our board. Um, our budget process, the key thing is we did the formula. I'll show you in here, and you can always call if you want more information. The point is we divide the pool of money to our five colleges. Um, based on formulas and even to our district operations like facilities, et cetera. And then we allow discretion locally on how they take that pool of money that's based on how many students they're going to have and all of that. It's a formula. They ended up with a single dollar amount that they then can say how much is going to go to tutoring, how much is going to go to the classroom. And we found that worked for us because it's, it's not someone on high at the district 
knowing what's happening at our college, it allows them to then, as uh, long as it balances to the bottom line, they can then load the budget based on their unique knowledge of their campus and their priorities and programs. So that's been a, a huge thing. We do overlay that standard formula with anything we're doing district-wide. When we invested in advising to move to 350 to 1 um, on how an advisor for every 350 students, that was a change from history. Nobody had the money from that before. When we set aside money to do that, we then overlaid it and gave all of our colleges their portion of that on top of the normal operations. So that's the concept of what we do at Alamo Colleges. The actual model, the formula here, gives you the metrics we use. And then the key part I'll start wrapping up is um, we, when we look at strategic initiatives and overlays, we talk about with the board where what is part of our strategic plan of where we want to invest. And for the coming year, what we're in now, we are focused on smart growth. Uh, growth in the programs that lead to high wage, high demand jobs. Um, making sure that we are um, growing the access again, because we'd actually lost some access. Our completion was looking great. But then we've actually started going after access again too, through st strategic programs. And so our enrollment management plan to make sure we're not losing students in that front end was an investment we fo we're focusing in on. Advocacy efforts, because we know the reason students stop out is normally food insecurity, housing insecurity, childcare. It's not necessarily um, the academics. We got a lot of single parents and that are working two or three jobs. So the life of our students is complex. So we're investing to connect them to those resources, hopefully keep them in school. Student Success Fund, I mentioned, talent is our own employees. You always look at the, the wage competitiveness to retain and keep your employees. And so that's an important component of the budget. And then also a way that you can incent innovation, uh, even if it's a small amount that allows people to submit. I had this good idea, if I had funding, have a process to consider the idea and be able to then take a piece of the budget to give to much further in the organization to propel innovative thinking. So that's our focus. Uh, the last pieces are in here. Uh, we also look at cost benefit. We want to make sure it's scale. Anything we do for strategy, if it's affecting 50 students, maybe that's not, and, and disproportionately on the money, that's probably not where we need to go. So we pick strategies that take the magnitude of our students that we can do at scale, and we look at that cost benefit. So here was our pathways. We have advising, dual credit. There's information here on dual credit, of really looking at what our actual cost is. Since dual credit, a lot of that instruction is delivered at the ISD. So it, it doesn't bring the same cost structure of the facilities and instruction always. So even if you're waiving it, this cost structure may not be as high either. So we look at that. And then uh, some of momentum program. And I'll wrap up, my last slide is for you, to turn it back to you on the questions you need to ask as a board or consider when you are thinking about the budget. What are the budget policies? Go look at the budget policies of your institution. You can also look at budget policies from other institutions. You may have some good ideas in there. You know, it's always good to borrow, right, and build on. So I'd, I'd recommend that. And it's, again, those decisions of whether you can carry forward budget, uh, if you have a reserve in there, if you have a strategic uh, item, um, how much you set aside of your budget for contingency. Those kind of things are in the policy. Do you have a master plan for your facilities? Do you have a strategic plan of where you're going and it's multi-year and you're looking at the dollars, both the revenue and the expense that lines up with that? And that's the kind of information that your budget office and your leadership would be bringing to you. And then how does it work? You know, that you need to at least know in the number they bring you, how does the budget process work? Um, I think at a high level, we've done that with our board numerous times. Uh, so they know kind of our workload model that we do and why we did it. In the old days, whoever spent the most or yelled the loudest got more money. There was a little bit of across our colleges there was that going on. We adopted the model we did 10 years ago to make it totally fair. Anyone knows, they know what money they're gonna get. It's a formula, they can look at it, totally transparent. And then there, at their discretion, can allocate further. So for us, that works, because we're a very complicated structure. 
And then what are the long range implications of decisions you make now? If you make a decision to do something that's a recurring cost, and maybe your tax may turn, turn the other way, and the state may turn, you consider when you're making a decision, can you sustain it? So that's the roles that you as the board are really, those are the questions you want to be asking. So I've used up probably all my time, and I'll open it if, uh, if there's any burning question, I guess, and then certainly uh, anyone can contact me at Alamo Colleges if you need more information. Uh, if you're a, I'm Bill Greenhill with Tarrant County College. If if you are a, a new trustee, this is a massive undertaking. It's the budget process. It's uh, it's a massive undertaking, and it took me a couple of years to even figure out what what uh, I've been a trustee since 2011 to figure out what funds we have. What do you? How do you manage your board of directors, board of trustees? How do you give them this information? How much time do you give them to absorb this information? Because we are volunteers, and this is very, if you're in a large college like you and I are, it's a very complicated process. How do you educate your trustees about this process, your funds, et cetera, et cetera, so they can make informed decisions? Okay, great question. We've done it in a couple ways. Any new board member that comes in, we offer uh, to have available that we could have some individual work session kind of to, to, for them to understand the basics. How do, how's our debt work? How's the budget work? Uh, basic, you know, question, answer any questions one-on-one -on -one so they don't feel like in public air time. They're having to maybe be afraid to ask a question because they don't understand it. So we do offer that for any new board members. We're fortunate enough, our board, um, many of our board members have been on there a very long time. So we've had opportunity over time since we've been doing much of this process for 10 years. Um, but even we supplement that is depending on the need of our board on um, if we have a lot of new people or what, is we have a retreat, um, two retreats a year that's focused on the budget. It's normally, um, Lately, it's been like half a day. In some years, way back when, when we had some real challenges or we were really looking at some additional uh, information we wanted on some of these key strategies we were going after, we even did a six or eight hour. It was typically a Saturday uh, in that case um, to where we made it part of our process to do our first look. Um, used to be at the end in the fall, you know, already when you're publishing your budget book right now for the current budget year. We'd already be talking about the following year. We've now built a little time to get a little bit more actuals under our belt before we have the first conversation for next year's budget. And so ours will be in the January, um, early February for a first look that's focused on revenue and strategies. And then, then we do our July um, is when we have our, our big discussion in a work session. And that allows us then to answer all the questions, show all the details. And then we actually, in many cases, at that robust meeting where there's a lot of time given to it, uh, we can even get the approval, which allows us to actually open up both budget years in August on non-labor purchases. So we can get purchases going to be ready, be here by the time 9-1 starts for fall so that we can make that fall semester work better. Uh, so we, we try to get our budget approved in July. Um, so that's, that's us. Um, we also have special sessions and other things when we're dealing with um, master plan, utilization of our campus, other things that would be getting into the facility side. When we were going toward a CIP, we would do uh, other special sessions. I know other institutions, um, they have as part of their regular process, maybe a, a, a head of a board meeting, couple hours, depending on what their board is comprised of, if they're working or not, uh, to where they have these work sessions and maybe bite-sized pieces along the way. So there's multiple ways to do it. But for us, we focus on twice a year and then in a regular board meeting, maybe have a little discussion. 